Okay, well, good morning. I think we should get started. Uh, and following up some of the discussion yesterday, if a black hole is a quantum subsystem that can collect information, in one way of putting it, and uh, if evolution is unitary, uh, then information needs to transfer out of the black hole. I believe it's safe to say. And so there's a question of uh, what kinds of couplings can achieve that, how large they have to be, and how you describe that process. And uh, that's an example of a more general problem in information theory regarding transfer of information or transfer of entanglement. And Max is going to uh, discuss that and some work uh, done studying that. And then I think that uh, naturally could lead into some discussion as well. We have you know, people who are experts in thinking about information theory here uh, who may have some more insights. So Max, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, OK, good. So thanks. Uh, as Steve already mentioned, so my talk will be mainly related to the discussion we had yesterday and to what Steve introduced on Monday. So I'm keeping the pictures here because they are useful. Um, so Steve has already explained, has in his proposal uh, for departures, small departure from local quantum field theory to explain uh, how unitarity can be recovered in uh, black hole physics, uh, he needs to introduce an interaction term, this one, in the Hamiltonian, which couples the black hole degrees of freedom with the environment degrees of freedom and allows for information to be transferred from the black hole to the outside, to the exterior. And I will just change notation slightly from this picture, um, but my goal today will be just to phrase everything just in terms of quantum information theory. So this is really the motivation. This is what you should keep in mind. But Steve, in one paper about this um, a couple of years ago, uh, raised a conjecture, which is more general. It's, you can think about that in just in quantum information theory, which is what I'm going to do. Um, and it might have other applications. It's interesting that it seems, at least to us, that it has not been studied previously in the literature. Um, but you should keep in mind that at least Steve's main motivation and our main motivation is uh, uh, to understand black hole physics. So I will call here um, A the black hole degrees of freedom. As you, so this will be big A. I will call B the environment. And I will introduce some ancilla system, A bar, which is really not interacting with anything. Yeah. What is the environment? Just the exterior of the black hole. Yes. 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 Um, so here in this picture, you can think of a bar as being this early radiation, early Hawking radiation C, for example, uh, which is initially entangled with A. The goal will be to discuss how the correlation between A, A and, and A bar will be transferred to A bar and B due to interactions between small interactions between A and B only. Okay. But there could also be something far away from the black hole, the particles which leave or particles which enter, which are utterly far at infinity, which are also states that now might get entangled and so on in states here. Yeah, so the model I'm going to describe is much simpler because there will be no particles. It's just three Hilbert spaces, A, A bar, and B. So it would be a unclear from just that picture what exactly is going on in this more complicated setup. But A bar, but a bar could include... But A bar could include, yes. Yes, so yes. Far away and far away. Right, yeah, yeah. Okay, so... just to represent this a little bit more schematically. Suppose that initially, let's say t equals 0, we are in a situation where we have these three Hilbert spaces, and we have a and a bar correlated, but we have no correlation. b is just in some tensor product state. So 
let's say that this is some state uh, psi of a a bar tensor some other state on b and let's say that we let a and b interact so we have some unitary evolution between uh, a and b but we are doing nothing on a bar it's just some ancilla system so generically this is generally true for basically any quantum system what will happen is that we will obtain some new situation where basically everything is correlated. Now the situation we are interested into is one where, let's say, at late times, um, the degrees of freedom, all the correlations that we initially we had between A and bar will be transferred to B and A bar. So we will end up in a situation which looks like this. But now this is some product state. OK, so and let's say that we want this to be true approximately. So we want to be, we want our final state, which I will call uh, Okay, see. So final to be close to something like this, uh, some state, okay, whatever, phi prime on A, and something on A bar B, and we want to be close in some measure, let's say trace norm, to something like that. Now, <coughs> I just want to mention that there are theorems in quantum information theory that show how something similar to this can happen, but there are results that actually show that if we have like a random unit, for example, we apply some random unitary here on A and B, the final situation will be different from this one. So this is just to mention that what we want to achieve and to obtain a situation like this, it's not completely generic. So in fact, what will happen is that, so this is a the one of the many decoupling theorems, which this was proven by Patrick Hayden, Andreas Winter, and some other people, I think in 2007, something like that. You can actually show that, um, so this is just the average. Uh, let me write it down, and then I'll explain. So if you are in a situation like the one I just erased, uh, but you actually apply some random unitary, some random unitary UAB, which acts on system A and B, and then you average of all possible unitaries, the trace norm between the state this is a reduced density matrix now on A A bar, and these are the marginals of the reduced density of this reduced density matrix when you trace out A bar or A respectively. And this all depends, of course, on the unitary U. And this should be a tensor product. The distance between these two states depends on the size, the dimensions of the Hilbert spaces. And if the dimension of the Hilbert space B is much larger than the dimension of A, then this is small, less than some epsilon. If db is much larger than the a, which is what we are always going to assume. So, but also you can also show that the average of this trace norm.
Oh, and what I mean by this dot is just something which is like order one. It's just a combination, it's a complicating expression, which is just a combination of purities. And likewise here. So this is the distance between uh, the reduced density matrix on subsystem A in the final state and the maximally mixed state. And the fact that this also will be small means, this, these two statements mean that basically A and A bar will be essentially uncorrelated. This is this statement. This means that the subsystem A will be very close to being maximally entangled. So we are not in a situation like that. What actually happens is that there is a splitting of the Hilbert space B into two parts, B1, B2. And part of B will be highly correlated with A, so that A is essentially maximally entangled, and part of B will be highly correlated with A bar, so that also A bar is essentially maximally entangled. So the old correlations are transferred. So this is different from the situation that we want because we don't want this correlation here. We want this to disappear. But of course, this is just what happens if we apply random unitaries. And what in our setup, the, well, still setup, uh, is very different because we don't have random unitaries. We actually have an Hamiltonian with very small coupling. So let me get into the details about that. Um, any question about this? It just unitary draw randomly from the unitary group according to her measure. I'm just trying to understand what this means physically. Oh, physically, I don't know. It's, uh, I think the, 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 the main point I want to make is that f the physical picture will be very different from this. And therefore, this result should not be trusted. And it doesn't really apply to this situation we have in mind. Um, Right, but, uh, but eventually this will disappear, but this is A is the black hole. Right, but in subsequent times, it can now come out. And mm. Because I guess if I, think of, if I think of the operation as a random unitary followed by sending out qubits, which is what it is, then you, know, uh, you do a few random unitaries and send out qubits and you decouple from A bar. Then you do some more random. So now you're just in you just have this new create entanglement which never existed before. Now you do some more random unitaries. You won't destroy entang. You won't decouple from A bar, but you don't need to. And now stuff comes out, and that will get rid of the entanglement between A and B. Mm -hmm. By the way, one way of putting it is in the black hole problem, and you know there are analogous problems just in you know thermalization of subsystems and so on. Uh, there's a, a little extra structure, and the extra structure in the black hole case is that in the end, you know, basically A is disappearing. Okay, so all of its entanglement needs to transfer out. It, and so that's something else you have to put in uh, as part of, say, the evolution. Um, one way of thinking of A disappearing, instead of saying A disappears, you could say A initially has some energy, B is a much bigger system, they're interacting, and if B is a much bigger system, sort of by the second law of thermodynamics or something, it, in one way of putting it, it you know, the quantum version of that, uh, all of the energy is going to basically transfer out of A and disperse into the bigger system. Sure, no, no, I'm not saying that the final state can be that. I'm just saying if the process is random unitaries moving stuff out, random unitaries moving stuff out, then eventually the same. You'll first just decouple from A bar, which is the real information you're trying to get out, and then you'll just be left with entanglement. <coughs> which will eventually come out as well. Yeah. Well, but the random unitaries can probably keep entangling A and B, one, yeah. or A and some subsystem. How, how do you decouple A from, from any part of B? 
if you just have the random unitaries. Well, usually, these things aren't just doing random unitaries. They're doing a random unitary, and then they're moving qubits. So the random unitary ah, doesn't okay. do anything. But ah, I see. Okay. That's what you're doing there, right? No. Here, I was just applying random unitary on A and B. Right. Okay. But that's the same as... So but if you did the same thing... Okay. <coughs> Okay, so the setup is different, as I was saying, because the Hamiltonian now here is some Hamiltonian, some acting on A, some Hamiltonian acting on B, plus an interaction term. But the interaction term is of this form. So there is, let's say that there is some energy scale which is fixed by these two Hamiltonians here, and then... Uh, There are some coupling CI and some operators acting on A and acting on B where we can assume the operators uh, to have unit norm so that once we have fixed the scale and the operators have unit norm, then the, coefficient, the coupling CI are, let's say, much less than one. So this is the crucial difference, is that we have a very small coupling between system A and system B, which is very different from having random unitaries. Okay, so I think one question, like level zero question, is whether this set, uh, these assumptions, let's say that, for example, we can assume these Hamiltonians to be random and these operators uh, can be random uh, with norm one, and this coupling is as small, is that sufficient, is that enough to obtain what we want as a final state? Which is, as I said, not this, but something like this. So the intuition is that, yeah. This is an it, it, this is energy. It's an energy scale fix. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why is the H interaction small? Did, why are these small? Yes. This is Steve's assumption. It's a small departure from local quantum field theory, so you don't want very strong coupling between black hole and environment. Otherwise, you can get yeah, huge amount. Yeah. I'm trying to fill in the details in the walls I have. I don't see why the H interaction is small. Not local at the Planck scale, sure, but it's local. You go much beyond the Planck scale. Do you have? Well, in principle, you could consider C either large or small, and you know the problem is something you can study in either case. Uh, an interesting case is when it is small, uh, because it looks like you can achieve what we want in that case. Uh, in a certain sense, so uh, you know that's that's an interesting limit to study. But also, you know, C of order one is worth studying, although that, in the black hole context, might be describing a bigger departure from the usual local quantum field theory story. Question. Yep. How many O's are you summing over? Because if C's are small, but you're summing over many operators. Uh, yeah, I would say small number of terms. Yeah, I'm being very sloppy here, but not too many terms, because if you have, like, strong coupling and many terms here, then it's, you're approaching the situation where you have, like, a random unit. Okay, so Steve's intuition for this is that basically if we have some, let's say that these are the energy, the levels of the Hamiltonian A, and uh, Hilbert space B is much larger, so let's say that we have spectrum is much more dense, then it should be easy, typically, if you have a small interaction between the two, it should be easy for this system to decay, in some sense. So in, if this decays nicely, basically, you can think of, if, if A is initially correlated with some system A bar, you can, if it's maximally entangled, for example, you can imagine that this is, is some system has some infinite temperature, and what happens is it's basically cooling down. And it's cooling down to a situation, it, you want achieve something which is exactly like this, but you might end up in a situation which is very close to this one. Because you basically have an energy flow from here to here, 
and this will approach its ground state, essentially. And therefore, it will, in the end, be essentially uncorrelated from, from B. But let's assume for a moment that we will end up under some assumptions, which might be exactly this one, or this is part of the question, I mean, whether these assumptions here are enough to achieve something like this, or whether these are still too generic and we need to input some further assumption here. But let's assume for the moment that this is sufficient, that we will end up in a situation like this. How does this happen? So we would like to understand in more detail how, at what rate, for example, the correlations are transferred from A to A bar. So first of all, we need to measure correlation somehow. The most natural thing to do is to use the mutual information. So we will use just quantum. We will look at the quantum mutual information between A bar and B at time t. Now, A bar is just an ancilla system. It's not interacting with anything. So this quantity can be just computing using A and B as follows. So this is just the entropy of A bar at time t plus the entropy of B at time t minus the entropy of A bar B at time t. And this is not doing anything, so this is actually just the entropy of A bar at time 0. And the entire system, OK, A, A bar B is a pure. So the entropy of A, A bar is just the entropy of A. And the initial entropy of A bar is equal to the initial entropy of A because A, A bar was uncorrelated from B to begin with. OK, so what we are interested in, too, is the basically the rate of transfer of information, so which we define as just the derivative of this mutual information with respect to time. So this object has been studied before in quantum information theory. But what people, at least to my knowledge, what people have been looking at is just the initial rate at t equals 0. And typically, what people were trying to do was to try to understand under what condition, under which Hamiltonian or which initial states, this rate can be maximized. This will not be our situation, because for us, the initial state is one where a is only correlated with A bar, but it's not correlated with B. So for us, this thing is actually 0. So the expectation is that if we just plot this mutual information against time, the expectation is that something like this will happen, uh, something like that. Basically, there is a, at small times, this goes like t square. And this is completely generic. It's just a consequence of the fact that there is initially, there is no correlation between A and B. Then we expect some uh, growth, which is on average, in some average sense, is roughly linear. In other words, we expect this at intermediate times and for quite long times to be essentially constant. I just want to stress this fact. We don't expect this to be always constant. It's, it's on some, in some average sense, constant at intermediate times. And then after some t, which I will call t star, somewhere here, it will, the, the mutual information will essentially saturate. Furthermore, what Steve conjectured is that in this interval of times, this constant rate will be essentially given by the energy scale times some constant k times the sum of the squares of the couplings. So this is the conjecture. Okay.
Okay, so we don't know how to show that this is true in full generality. I mean, this is the big question. Uh, and we would be very happy to discuss with anybody who's interested. But let me just give you, um, let me just show you a simple example where we can actually see that something like that might happen. So the intuition for this comes from uh, the picture I had before about the decay of system A when in a large environment B due to small interaction. And it comes essentially from Fermi Golden's rule. So the decay rate for unit time is, this is just Fermi Golden's rule, it's just given by this interaction. And this is just the density of state. <laughs> so it's roughly constant in time. And it depends on the interaction terms this way. Of course, we are in a slightly different situation here because the, our initial state for A is a mixed state, but that doesn't really play any major role, um, as I can show you in a simple example. So let's say that we have a qubit, a single qubit. So A is just one qubit. And B is large. And A bar, we are always assuming that A bar is the same, the Hilbert space of A bar is the same dimension of the Hilbert space of A, so this is also one cube. And consider the following evolution. So suppose that we have an initial state um, on A, B, of this form. Let me ignore a bar just for a second. Um, so zero here means some initial state for B. It can be anything. It could be the, it could be the, the uh, zero energy state, but it could also be something of higher energy as far as transitions are allowed so that A can still decay. And let's assume that this is, this will be with some probability, which depends on time, <coughs> nothing happens. And with some probability, this qubit will actually decay. So t zero i. And that if instead the initial state of A was zero, by energy conservation, nothing happens. The state will remain the same. Now, this thing here, well, or more precisely, this is the probability at time t that this qubit A will actually decay. And alpha of t modulo square is 1 minus p of t is the probability that it doesn't decay. And in this simple situation, it's straightforward to write down what the density, final density, the density matrix draw a, b at time t will be under the assumption that the initial state, let's say psi a, a bar at t equals 0, is just maximally entangled. State. You can consider anything else, but for example, let's consider this one. I won't write down the full expression, but um, let me just write down what the reduced density matrices are. So it's straightforward to actually compute this. So the reduced density matrix for A under this evolution is 1 half 1 plus P of T, 0, 0 plus one half, one minus p of t, one, one, and rho b, two, where 
this thing here is an unnormalized pure state. It's actually psi prime is just this. So from there, uh, where is it? It's trivial to compute the von Neumann entropies that we need. As I showed before, as I showed here, we don't care about, the, we just need the von Neumann entropy of A and B to compute the mutual information we want. And the final expressions are the following. So this is minus one half. P of T. Now, uh, if you look at this expression for t equals 0, you can immediately check that if you assume that at initial time the probability at time equals 0 is 0, then you can immediately check that the entropy of A, that this is correct, the entropy of A is log 2, as it should be, this was just a single qubit, and the entropy of B is 0 as it should be, because B is not correlated uh, with anything initially, so that the initial mutual information uh, between A bar and B is zero. But at later time, so let's say that for large time, let's assume that the probability of decay w at large times is close to one, then uh, you can check that the entropy of A is actually 0, and the entropy of B now is log 2. So that the mutual information between A bar and B now is 2 log 2. <coughs> so that we are in the situation, basically, that we want. So you can... Uh, what you can do, you can basically do, for example, some numerical check. You can just numerically consider a state where a, a, a system where A is a single qubit and B is like few qubits, like seven or eight qubits. And you can just evolve things numerically. You can compute these probabilities numerically. You can actually, so you can compute numerically the probability of decay and use these two expressions to plot the mutual information, uh, how the mutual information evolves with time. Or you can just ignore this expression completely, just do numerical evolution, and directly compute the mutual information between A bar and B, and compare the two situations. You can actually see that, at least in this very simple setup, the two different calculations match very nicely. So in a, very, in a simple example like this, this simplified model, the simplified model of evolution that was on this board and now I erased, is actually a very good approximation to what really happens. So this is not very strong evidence that the conjecture is true, but it's some evidence that at least in some simple, in some simple setup, it could be true. Oh yeah. So. Uh, 
these two formulas here come from uh, this uh, simplified model of devolution that I was I had on the board. Right. So the thing I was, for example, disallowing transition with violate energy conservation, like from zero. It, um, I was neglecting some terms in the evolution. The, the, the expression I wrote before. Um, I thought you wrote the no, no, that that is no. Okay, so that is the point. Yeah. So what I was writing down is that, for example, if you in initially have the state zero zero, this will exactly transition to zero zero which doesn't have to be the case necessarily. Of course, this is strongly, I mean, th this is essentially what will happen by energy conservation, but so, there might be some probability. Yeah, what are you assuming about the energy spectrum of the second system? Of the second, si of system B, yeah. I'm assuming that the, the spectrum of B is very dense because the Hilbert space of B is much larger, yeah. and that the spectra of the two Hamiltonian are such that the transitions from A to B are allowed nicely, so that the A will typically decay, which doesn't have to be if you just take arbitrary quantum systems. The transitions might be disallowed, for example. If I just cook up some Hamiltonian with energy levels that I can choose as I want, it's not necessarily the case that that qubit can decay. So okay, then, then there was this, the other part of the evolution, but this is not the most general evolution that you can write down. So these two formulas in principle don't have to match what is really going on. So if you just take a system uh, of one qubit for A and seven qubits, this is what we did for example, for B, and you just generate random Hamiltonians, there's in principle no reason to believe that this simplified model of evolution will actually match what you would obtain numerically by doing the exact evolution, just numerically. But this is not, but what we actually verified is that these two formulas are very, give a very good approximation to what really happens. And therefore you can trust them to some extent. So in some sense you're supporting the decay, the simple decay. Yes, exactly. For small coefficient c, in fact, good. So, if you if you use large coefficient, the two pitches won't match. We should that one. Yeah, exactly. Yes, you are, you are in a situation where you, which is similar to the one where you have random unitaries between a and b. Exactly. Thanks. That's a good point. Um, okay. So, and then you can also verify. Um, that uh, you obtain a picture like this where you can just compute what the rate is and you can actually check that the rate does in fact depend on the square of the couplings by, with this expression. Then you can also um, cook up some other models which are like slightly more general than this where you don't have a single qubit in A, you have more qubits and again you cook up some evolution, some uh, evolution of this kind here, some more general picture where you have more levels on A and you can see that things still, ma things still match but what we would like to have is a more general uh, derivation for why this has to be true and under what condition this exactly is true. Um, I don't know how to do this. I just want to uh, yeah, okay. mention uh, one possible direction. I don't know if it's actually feasible, but I think it's interesting. Um, So, one thing that I, I have no idea how to prove this, how to prove that the decay rate is essentially given by this expression, but 
one thing that one could try to do first is to actually try to show that this time here depends, goes basically like 1 over sum over i, ci squared. So this will not necessarily automatically prove that the rate is constant, that it depends uh, on the couplings in this fashion. But if you can show that this time t star essentially depends on the coupling in that fashion, well, that's already a good start, I think. So one possible way to do this, I think, might be to use a theorem. Uh, this is by short and Farrelly, 2011. This is a general theorem about um, equilibration of finite systems in finite time uh, in an approximate sense. So I just want to mention what the theorem is. Um, the theorem says the following, that given some small energy, I will explain things in more detail in a second, but given some small energy, epsilon and some time t, the following is true for um, any Hamiltonian. Let me call this A. So here, Rho A is the same thing I was mentioning before. This is just a reduced density matrix of A. So th this is a ge completely general theorem. So for them, this will be, OK, let me call it S. Because you can imagine any system and, uh, which is evolving, evolved by some Hamiltonian, and you can consider any subsystem S. And this is a general theorem about any possible situation you can imagine where for any possible subsystem S. Omega S here is the time average of rho s um, from 0 to infinity. So the statement is a statement about the distance in trace norm between the actual state of the subsystem s at time t and its time average between 0 and infinity on average in, time, in the time t. So this is the time average from 0 to capital T of this trace norm. And the result is that this is bounded by 1 half square root of d s squared n of epsilon, which I will explain. This is something that depends on the Hamiltonian. Okay, so here ds is just the dimension of the Hilbert space of subsystem S. df is a number which depends on the initial state. The point is that this is a theorem not about uh, thermalization, it's a theorem about equilibration. So there's still some information about the, some dependence from the initial state. Um, This is what they call the effective dimension of the state, which is just defined as follows. Trace of Pn rho 0 squared. So uh, rho 0 is the initial state of the full system, not just the subsystem. And P energy projectors on the energy eigenspaces. So the Hamiltonian here is just sum over n, P n e n. So this is the only place where the dependence uh, on the initial state enters, this number here. Then d e is the number of different energy levels in the Hamiltonian. And 
n of epsilon is what they call the density of energy gaps. Which is defined as follow. Um, let me write it here. So it's the maximum over all energies of the So given some small number epsilon, uh, you look at the energy interval E, E plus epsilon, and you look at all possible ener such energy intervals, and you maximize over them. And you look at all uh, energy gaps, EI minus Ej, so where alpha is just a pair Ij, and G is just all possible the set of all possible um, of all possible pairs. So it's just um, Ij with I and J that go from one to DE with I different from J. So for any such interval, you look at all the energy gaps and you count them. And N epsilon is for given epsilon the maximum number of energy gaps that you have in that interval. So this is where so the, the, the dependence on the Hamiltonian enters here and here, the, and sorry, here and here. The dependence on the initial state enters here. So the question is whether one could use this theorem by basically, of course, one would have to compute some averages because here everything, we, we can assume that here everything is random. We can draw a, the Hamiltonian for A randomly, for B randomly, the operators randomly, and one should compute how this expression depends on the couplings um, and see whether one could uh, derive, let's say that one could fix, one could define T star as um, the time such that the mutual information has reached some like 90% of the maximal value, something, something like that. Um, and one could try to see whether one could derive that dependence using a theorem like this one. Um, I don't know if that is doable or not. I don't know how hard it will be, but I think this is an interesting direction. So I just wanted to mention it's, it's a workshop. Yeah. So, so there are people looking at the time, time to get to an equilibrium state. Sorry? I guess they're looking at the time to get to an equilibrium state. Yeah, it's just that it's, a, it's equilibration in some average sense. Uh, because the point is that in a finite time, you might have fluctuations. Uh, so. This is why there is this time average and this time average here. So the, the, what they're looking at is, let's say that some system, some subsystem will equilibrate eventually in some, at some time. So if you will wait long enough, um, this will actually equilibrate. This is what omega s is saying. But it could be, so what they're asking is, to some approximation, um, to what extent do you reach, does the subsystem s actually reaches some state which is very close to omega s in some finite time capital T. And, what is, and how does T depend on how good the approximation should be and the parameters, the Hamiltonian or the initial state? And, and to use it, you're going to assume that the equilibrium state has a certain amount of energy. Right, yes. So, yes. so one question, like before even doing any calculation of that kind, is to actually check that, the, that omega s, that under the condition, the assumption that we want, 
we will have equilibration and omega s is the kind of state that we want so that we actually have obtained the transfer of information as we wanted. Under, if that happens, then, or under, we might have to impose further restriction, maybe not. But if this happens, then one can try to use this theorem to actually derive that dependence on the time scale t star on the couplings. OK, so this is all I wanted to say. Thanks. So we have a little time for discussion of the general question. I think it, it's an interesting question how to, um, in general, show, uh, or how in general to compute the rate of information transfer in this kind of coupled system, uh, or you know, when you have two coupled subsystems like this. Uh, as mentioned, you know, one application is a black hole coupled to its environment, if you think of them as you know, the black hole is being a quantum subsystem and the environment is being another quantum subsystem. But you know, more generally, you could have quantum sensors or other quantum devices and ask how quickly they decohere depending on the, their couplings to the environment. Or you can ask how quickly uh, subsystems of uh, systems that are thermalizing, uh, how quickly they will uh, thermalize. It's the same problem all the way across. And it seems that that has not been uh, fully understood uh, so far as we can tell in the quantum information theory literature. And so, uh, you know, that's what we're trying to do is improve the understanding of that. And anyway, if there are further thoughts or ideas, uh, those would be welcome. And, and once again, this, this is an important question because if you think black holes transfer information out, somehow accumulate information and then it transfers out, uh, you want to understand how big the couplings need to be that do that. Comments, questions? Yeah, since I have an explicit picture of what, what the black hole could look like, I'm going to try to see if I'm going to fill out the details there. And the picture is that we can expand in an outgoing radiation into spherical waves, for every L, every explicit value of L and M, you have no interaction with the other L's and M's, and the system behaves just as a single particle coming in and a single particle coming out, which at the horizon are related by a complicated integration kernel, which I can write down. So in principle, I can fill out all the details and see uh, how much sense this whole thing makes. So it looks very chaotic from your point of view, but I, my claim is, if you make, a, uh, if you do the right spherical wave expansion, uh, all, all the chaos disappears, and you get the, uh, basically everything nearly diagonalized. So it's, it may be an interesting exercise to try to diagonalize as much as you can of, of all these matrices, all these operators that you're using. Uh, well, th this is a different. I mean, it also applies in Steve uh, setup to black hole physics, but. It's a more general question in quantum information theory. So to me, it looks like just you're, you're handling an unstable particle. It could be a nucleus absorbing mm -hmm. and emitting mm -hmm. gamma rays yes. or whatever. And, and, and so the black hole shouldn't be any different from that. Right. That's the, the general idea. Yeah. Other comments or questions? Yeah, maybe, so maybe just to mention some of the, li the quantum information literature, mm -hmm. which I, is partially related to this. The, the, there's this stuff by, I think, Beckenstein and, and Pendry on, you know, what is the maximum speed of getting information through a channel. Uh -huh. um, I guess there's this kind of, well, there, there seems to be a, a tendency to, to posit that black holes are the fastest X. Uh, so, I, okay. I, you know, one might ask, are, are they... Th does information come out the fastest for, for black holes with respect to these bounds? Because they saturate these bounds, so that, that may be, those bounds may be of interest okay. uh, for this sort of thing. And then there's a bunch of stuff on what people call quantum state transfer, which is um, usually people are looking there not as much how the information changes, but the fidelity of the stuff that comes out. Can, you know, how quickly can a state move along a spin chain or something? Uh -huh. And that goes by the name of quantum state transfer. Um, and then there's another bunch of literature under the name of um, quantum speed limits, which is 
Uh, yeah, I saw something related to this. I mean, there was a paper by Bravi, for example, which was related to that, and where he was looking at this quantity, but as I mentioned before, just at time equals zero. There was something, some conjecture also uh, by Kitayev about that, and th there's some literature on that, yeah. but it's all I could find in that context was about just initial transfer rate, right. and not how the rate depends on later times. Yeah, the, I guess the, related to that is the one which is related to that is, is maybe more relevant to this would be like a Lee Robinson bound, mm -hmm. where you where the, where the rate is bounded by some elements of the Hamiltonian, but then people try and improve it. So given a particular Hamiltonian, what could you say about the transfer rate? Mm -hmm. I, I guess the issue with most those are most interactions transfer information both ways, right? So if I yeah. give you an arbitrary interaction. Stuff will come backwards and forwards. Yes, which is not what we want here. So. Right, but I, is it, it seems a bit artificial to, like, it seems a bit, art, what is it about your interaction which will stop when the information comes out and not allow a back? I, I guess energy conservation would be his, his answer to that. Yeah. A, yeah. It's like what Gerard just said as well. Uh, yeah. Light decay is an unstable thing. And you know, what that means is the energy from the thing ultimately dissipates into the environment. Yes, yeah, so I agree that from a purely quantum information point of view, I mean, this doesn't have to happen. Uh, it can have very different behavior. But I also think the other picture is reasonable, and it would be interesting to use quantum information theory techniques to understand what exactly is going on in more restricting, uh, restricting setup. Uh, yeah, maybe a brief comment. Um, so unfortunately, I've missed uh, half of your talk because of the delay. Okay. But, uh, so what you're um, doing up there, it seems you're looking at the um, temporal behavior of the um, mutual information. Yes. And uh, I guess you're interested in this um, in the slope. Yes. So there seems to me to be, the, or there seems to me to be related to some work um, that people have done also, well, actually like both from quantum information and quantum gravity. So they were looking at the um, Kolmogorov Sinai rates and the growth of entanglement entropy uh -huh. over time. Um, also, indeed, looking at uh, systems with an interaction term like this, I think. Um, and indeed, also about this work was about proving uh, um, under which conditions you exactly get this uh, this behavior. Okay, um, so I nice. think it's not exactly mutual information, but of course that's related to entanglement entropy. And um, so, I mean, I could give you the. References okay, thanks. So that would be very useful. Work. It's from the last three years or so. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I guess if since we want quantum gravity to have like a like to have the right classical limit in the end, uh, is there like a sense in which this information transfer under what conditions can be labeled as classical? Um, any idea on those lines? Hmm. Like, should the information transfer be? Of a certain kind, should it be like maximized, minimized, should it be. It's classic. Yeah, I don't know because here, I mean, clearly we we also have quantum correlations because we have quantum entanglement, and we have not drawing drawing any distinction between quantum and classical correlation as. As, as long as we use the mutual information, we're just capturing just the total amount of correlation. So I wouldn't know. Uh, Maybe I could possibly add just a tiny bit to that. Uh, so again, if a black hole is a subsystem and you want to transfer the information out or the entanglement out, there's a rate at which that needs to happen, roughly one qubit per light crossing time. And so that's what you would like to achieve and then if you have some couplings between the black hole and its environment, whatever you want to propose, uh, you know, say, Gerard's picture, my picture, you have a picture, whoever, uh, you know, there's some question of, uh, you know, what couplings are needed to achieve that rate? You know, how big do they have to be? And that's important because those couplings are probably a departure from local quantum field theory, so far as we understand, and so we want to quantify how big that departure needs to be. Uh, and so this is a first step towards that. If the uh, rate goes like the coupling squared, uh, that's supporting this Fermi's golden rule kind of estimate. And uh, one other thing that can go into that Fermi's golden rule estimate is not just the couplings, but the density of final states. And the uh, message which you know isn't quite here in this story is that um, you can achieve a 
reasonable rate, 1 over r, 1 qubit per light crossing time, uh, with you know, this kind of formula where you have a uh, collection of very small couplings, but the smallness is made up for by the large density of final states. Again, like a decay of a very complicated system with a you know, large number of final states. You know, it doesn't have to be a black hole. So that's interesting, that you can apparently achieve uh, sufficient information transfer uh, with very tiny couplings and, you know, in this kind of system. And in, when you're talking about a black hole, the thing that makes it run, potentially, is uh, the large number of final states of the black hole. Other comments or questions? It is a very interesting physical system, well known among our experimenters, which is the KK bar system. And when you produce the particle, you either produce a K or you produce a K bar under very different circumstances. So you always produce one of the two, not both. But then 50% of the K is a K long, and 50% is a K short. The K long uh, is fairly stable, and the K short decays 100 times faster. So, but if you produce a K <coughs> or a K bar, then you get a non-exponential decay, they call it. And so that's uh, an interesting system, but you can see that by diagonalizing it, it, bec it becomes again normal. But it's not produced in a diagonal state when you uh, produce the particle. So, so black holes could be a, a big uh, extension of such a situation. You produce it in an asymmetric state but you can decide to diagonalize all the states and then things look simple again. If you know how to diagonalize the, 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 the Hamiltonian, but it could be very complicated to do. Okay, any other comments or questions? All right, if not, let's uh, break for coffee and uh, we'll return at the top of the hour and let's thank Max again. <laughs>